Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, an ancient megaraptor has been discovered in Australia, two new species of feathered dinosaurs have been found, and Mars used to have idyllic beaches, and much more. Now, if you're only interested in the science news and not really in 7 Days of Science itself, then you can now skip forward into the title sequence. But for those who have been following us on our long journey to give you the best updates we can on what's been going on in science every week, this Friday marks seven years since we started the 7 Days of Science series. The last seven years of science has been an awesome ride, and the series has grown massively since its first inception. We've got new presenters, a new set, new soundtrack, logo, and lots more. We kept it going through our various exams, COVID, our South Africa, and more recently our Morocco adventures, to bring you seven years of science every single week. Granted, we haven't always been able to do it on a Wednesday, we haven't always been on time, but we've never missed a week in the last seven years, and that's something we're all rather pleased about. We've got a couple of things planned to celebrate seven years of science, including releasing our monthly discussion of the science news right here on YouTube. In the meantime, we'd like to know something from you. Whether you followed us from last week or you've been there since the beginning, what have been your favourite news stories in the last seven years? Let us know in the comments and, well, we'll read them, I guess. I don't know if we'll do anything with them, but we'll read them and that'll be fun and I want to know and I'm in... Our top story this week is the exciting discovery of some ancient Megaraptor dinosaur fossils. They've been uncovered in Australia, in rocks dating to more than 118 million years ago. Megaraptors are an intriguing lineage of predatory dinosaurs that are probably related to tyrannosaurs. Unlike their small-armed cousins, these creatures boasted very large, flexible forearms bearing enormous claws used for dispatching prey. The Megaraptors first evolved in the early Cretaceous, sometime around 130 million years ago, and lived right up until the end of the age of the dinosaurs, 66 million years ago, culminating in the enormous Maip macrothorax from Argentina, the apex predator of this region at the end of the Cretaceous. These newly described Australian fossils include two specimens of Megaraptorids. One is a lower leg bone, and the other comprises two vertebrae from the tail. These bones are now the oldest known fossils in the world from members of the family Megaraptoridae, a subgrouping within the larger group Megaraptora. These bones also came from species that must have been quite big animals, somewhere in the range of six to seven meters in total body length. So these new finds indicate that the Megaraptorids were achieving large body sizes even earlier on in their evolutionary history than previously realized. In addition to these Megaraptor specimens, the researchers also described two leg bones that come from two different Carcharodontosaurian dinosaurs, plus another leg bone belonging to an Unenlagene, a group within the dromaeosaurs, commonly called the raptors. Not to be confused with the Megaraptors, of course. This is the first time that Carcharodontosaurs have been found in Australia, and interestingly, these are quite small-bodied dinosaurs, so it might suggest that in Australia there was somewhat of a role reversal compared to what was happening in South America for much of the Cretaceous. Instead of giant Carcharodontosaurs and smaller Megaraptors, here in Australia it appears to have been the Megaraptors that were filling the role of top predator. These are some remarkable new fossil finds, greatly expanding our knowledge of Australia's past and shedding some more light on the evolution of the mysterious Megaraptors. In other dinosaur news, a new species of long-necked sauropod dinosaur has been named from fossils found in Romania. It's called Uriash Kariki, and it's known from a partial skeleton including tailbones and parts of three limbs. They were all originally excavated back in 1914, but haven't been recognised as coming from a distinct species until now. Uriash lived at a time when Europe was made up of many islands forming an archipelago, and it's quite unusual, as it's significantly larger than many of the other European sauropods living at this time. It has an estimated body length of almost 12 metres, and a mass between 5 to 8 tonnes. Many of the other sauropods living here have been hypothesised to have experienced 
insular dwarfism, evolving to be smaller in size due to the limited resources on their island homes. But Uriash was an order of magnitude bigger, and so the researchers suggest two explanations. One is that these larger sauropods didn't experience the same selection pressures to become smaller as they weren't competing with other similarly sized sauropods. The other is that the dwarfing of sauropods occurred earlier in time, and that the dwarf sauropods which coexisted with Uriash are simply descendants of those smaller dinosaurs. It's a very interesting study and also revises some of the taxonomy and classification of the dwarf sauropods themselves. So, lots of interesting stuff there. But that's not it for the new dinosaurs this week, as scientists have also named two new species of small theropods uncovered from rocks in China. They date to about 125 million years ago, and both are known from beautifully preserved, almost complete skeletons. One of these new dinosaurs has been named as a new species of the already named genus Cynosauropteryx, being called Cynosauropteryx linguanensis. The other is recognised as an entirely new genus and species, and is named Uodanosaurus sinensis. The original Cynosauropteryx species was named back in 1996, and was actually the first non-bird dinosaur to be found, preserved with distinct feathery filaments. So it's exciting to now have a second species of this iconic dinosaur. The paleontologists also report the presence of small mammal bones within the body cavity of Huodanosaurus. These mammals were seemingly swallowed whole, therefore indicating that Tuodanosaurus probably wasn't capable of gripping and tearing apart its prey items. The researchers analysed the possible predation styles of these two new species, along with other small theropods known from the same geological formation. They find that they likely had distinct hunting methods, enabling all these similarly sized little carnivores to coexist with each other in the same environment. Also in the recent paleo news, a new species of prehistoric terrestrial croc has been discovered. Coming from rocks in Brazil, dating to around 125 million years ago, it's known from a partial skeleton, including an almost complete skull. It's been named Thelastocosuchus scutorectangularis. Thanks, guys. The genus name Thelastocosuchus translates to mammal crocodile, due to the fact that this croc and some of its relatives have surprisingly mammal-like tooth anatomy. It was a fairly small animal, and it belongs to a lineage of crocodiliforms known as the Notosuchians, a very diverse group of reptiles with all sorts of different anatomies and lifestyles. Thelastocosuchus is now the oldest Notosuchian to be discovered in Brazil, and possibly even all of South America. And so it teaches paleontologists a great deal about the early evolution of these amazing crocs on this continent. And in other news, a study published this week in the Astrophysical Journal Letters has given evidence to suggest that the supermassive black hole that sits at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy is much more active than we previously believed. The researchers used data gathered from the James Webb Space Telescope, taking a look at the black hole called Sagittarius A star in increments during 2023 and 2024, adding up to a total observation time of 48 hours. They observed several big and small flares bursting around the black hole per day, and while the flares themselves weren't a massive surprise, the frequency of them certainly was. The astronomers dubbed the black hole as unique, both for the frequency of activity and how variable the activity was. It's believed that the smaller and larger flares actually have two separate processes behind them. The smaller events are when hot plasma is compressed enough to spew out radiation, similar to a solar flare, whereas the larger flares are caused by the collision of two separate magnetic fields, which release particles that have accelerated almost to the speed of light. The team have expressed interest in wanting a longer, perhaps full 24-hour term on the James Webb Space Telescope to understand our galaxy's black hole further. Reeling it in now a little bit closer to Earth, as a study published this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal has reviewed data from the CNSA Jurong rover on subsurface rocks on Mars. There has been strong evidence from what they have found that there used to be a large ocean in the Northern Hemisphere. One of the authors of this study called this the clearest evidence yet that Mars contained at least one significant body of water and was therefore a more ideal habitat for life. The evidence uncovered by the Jurong rover suggested a sandy beach with light waves and wind across it, and it has been dubbed a proper vacation-style beach. 
Now, you may be wondering how the Jurong rover got any information at all about a rock under the surface of Mars. Well, it didn't dig it out, and used radar to detect the features that these researchers have attributed to a sloping beach. Comparisons were of course made to radar images of coastal deposits on Earth, and the team were able to rule out other possibilities for the dip in the rock that was once a beach. Yet another interesting study then into the geological history of the Red Planet, with further promising clues that it was once a suitable place for life to exist. In some human news for this week, a study published in Science Direct has taken a look at the effect of unexpectedness on pain, and whether or not unexpected pain is worse than pain we expect. The study looked to find out whether or not the surprise of pain actually increased pain intensity, or is just different because it updates the brain's estimate for how much pain it is about to feel. It found that the pain intensity itself was actually higher in a test that involved participants being stabbed with a knife in virtual reality, with a painful amount of heat in the real world simulating the pain that would cause. The researchers found that the pain that the participants felt was higher when the virtual knife disappeared and did not virtually stab the participant, but a delayed pain was still applied. The researchers say that understanding pain better can go a long way in helping develop pain relief and helping with the treatment and recovery for people suffering with chronic pain and trauma. Finally for this week, some news about the state of our planet's glaciers. Scientists have long known that mountain glaciers are melting, but a new study has shown that they are now melting faster than ever. In fact, they are shrinking more than twice as fast as in the early 2000s. From 2000 to 2011, the world's glaciers lost ice at the rate of about 255 billion tonnes annually. Over the next decade, that increased to around 346 billion tonnes annually. Alarmingly, in recent years, the melt has accelerated even more. In 2023, the last year data was analysed, a record 604 billion tonnes of ice was lost. 19 regions were studied, and glaciers in Alaska are melting at the fastest rate, losing about 67 billion tonnes of ice a year. In the past 24 years, Central Europe's glaciers have lost the highest percentage of ice of any region, and are now 39% smaller than they were in 2000. Overall, it is estimated that 7 trillion tonnes of ice have melted since 2000, contributing to a 2 cm rise in global sea level. This is not taking into account contributions to sea level rise from the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. The scientists' observations and recent modelling studies indicate that this loss in glacier ice will continue, and possibly even accelerate until the end of the century. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's been happening in the last seven years of science. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you really enjoy what we're doing. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Clara Middleton, Drush Trivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, John French, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Friar, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Stanforth Hopkins, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tendro, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.